any questions uh, you can type out on your chat box and also raise your hand to stop me if you have any issue okay all right the first topic and also the first chapter for this subject will be on international financial environment so here we will, we will first try to understand why is it important to understand uh, the international financial environment all right so if you look at this slide you will see that uh, at the topmost is an mnc which is a multinational corporation or multinational company and they are highly involved in the foreign exchange market so what is the mnc and what is the fx market the the green and the blue box here so a multinational corporation is a company that has a presence in many countries multinational something like toyota right is toyota a malaysian company no it is a japanese company but how come you see toyota uh, shops or toyota showroom all over malaysia because it has presence in malaysia another one a mcdonald's in mcdonald's a, a malaysian company no right mcdonald's is an american company but it is all over malaysia uh, last example will be grab you see grab all over right grab uh, grab food grab delivery green color motorbikes with green color back those are grab right or cars with green stickers those are grab but uh is grab a malaysian company initially yes but but now it is a singaporean company okay so it is not malaysian it is singaporean so it has presence in malaysia and if you go to cambodia thailand you will see grab also so does it mean uh, grab is a thai company no they are still a singaporean company because their head headquarters is in singapore but they have presence they offer their services in other countries as well these are the examples of multinational corporation and later we will uh, go deeper in to understand why there exists an mnc why is there mnc in the first place why toyota is in malaysia why mcdonald's is in malaysia we will we will go into that later but now we have to understand that all these MNCs, right? They and now now you understand why is MNC. Yeah? So I'll keep using the word MNC, which relates to multinational corporation. Okay, MNC. Mm -hmm. So all these MNCs, which operates in a lot of countries, they are in very strong need of foreign exchange. Okay, and in order to get foreign exchange, they has they have to get it from the market so what is foreign exchange foreign exchange is actually foreign currency so you see if grab is a singaporean company so they operate out of singapore but their drivers their their, their customers uh, in malaysia are all being charged and paid in ringgit malaysia right is ringgit malaysia the currency for singapore no so whatever they earn in malaysia is all in ringgit so how can this ringgit uh, be used in singapore means the company is in singapore the employees their their it uh yeah, grab is an app uh, so their it experts are all in singapore to run the app all based in singapore how how do you pay your 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 employees in singapore if your income you generate is not in singapore dollars right so they have to be very active in foreign exchange in order to convert all their earnings from other currencies back to their back to their um 
required currency in order to pay the staff. Okay, so um, broken down here, foreign exchange market here, they categorize the reasons why foreign exchange market is needed because uh, they need to pay for products, they need to pay their subsidiaries, and also because uh, they need to invest and finance international markets. Okay, these are the reasons broken down. Okay, so in this chapter, our objective is to identify the goal and organizational structure of an MNC. Next, we want to describe theories that justify international business. This is why I said why uh, people go and do business internationally. Okay, three, we want to explain common methods used to conduct international business. And uh, next is to provide a model for valuing these MNCs. Okay, moving forward, how do you manage an MNC? Managers uh, of all companies, not just MNC, their role is to make decisions, positive decisions, lah, and the goal is to maximize stock price. So, uh, you will see lah, a lot of companies, why they do this, why they do that, like, like McDonald's. Right, McDonald's. Uh. Do you eat McDonald's? You eat McDonald's. Why Why do they have a uh, so efficient service? Why do they keep their outlet so clean? Right, the reason is not just for your comfort, but because they want, they, they plan to also maximize the stock price, the value of the company. All right, so next, um, MNC whose parent fully own subsidiary it is important to manage all the mncs lah. so let's say company like a us company us parent is the sole owner of subsidiary like mcdonald's uh, you see mcdonald's all over the world but where is the main where is the parent company parent company is still in us Okay, the rest around the world are their MNCs. So the next one, we see that uh, in order to manage MNCs, uh, financial decisions are important because it influence and will be influenced by marketing, management, and uh, accounting and information systems. So they always have problems uh, when when it comes to managing a company or MNCs that there's a conflict of goals between manager and shareholder. So manager get a salary to manage the company. Shareholder pay the manager's salary and wants to get a return. So they have different goals. So that for their incur an agency cost. An agency cost is to is a cost in order to ensure managers maximize shareholders well. So when the company, uh, any company for that matter, any company that give bonuses to their manager because the manager perform well is actually a cost to the company. Why? Because this is the cost to make sure that managers perform well. So you want manager to perform well how? You cannot force them. You can only reward them. So agency cost. It is a cost to ensure that your agents uh, uh, do things shareholders want. So the cost, these agency costs are normally higher for an MNC. So there are companies that are MNC, they are not companies that are non-MNC. Right, but... Uh, now, most of the companies are MNC. La. Unless you say a small company, la. small company, then, then it is not MNC. But big brands uh, that you always hear of uh, are usually MNCs. 
and and an MNC cost or agency cost is usually higher. And the several reasons here they mentioned is because MNC is big, ma, and MNC is multinational. So there are a lot of countries of managers. So they need to manage countries, country managers from all over the world, and it is not easy. So the cost there will be high. It is more difficult to monitor. All right. And uh, foreign subsidiary managers raised in different cultures may not follow uniform goals, right? Like Malaysia, you hire a country manager in Malaysia and you hire a country manager in, let's say, in, uh, in Switzerland. Okay, in Switzerland, one is Europe, one is Asia. Two different uh, backgrounds. What Malaysian manager want? Probably Malaysian manager, they want money. All right. But if you use this same uh, reward for the Switzerland manager, which is you give them money, it may not work because probably in Switzerland, the manager uh, do not need so much money or, or money do not determine his happiness. What he want is work-life balance. So you cannot apply the same uh, reward for managers in different countries. So this is one of the challenge, challenges lah, in terms of solving agency uh, costs, uh, agency problems around the world for MNCs. So MNCs that are really large can create large agency problems. Okay, and um, especially this this textbook is based in the US, so they will talk about uh MNCs that are the parent company are US companies. So some non-US manager or outside of US, they do not look at long term. Okay, they always look at short term. Okay, so moving forward, how do you control agency problem? Parent of parent company usually control agency problem by clearly communicating goals for each subsidiary to ensure managers focus on maximizing the value of subsidiary. So how did they do that? If you notice, right, uh, MNC, big companies, on and off, they have a uh, um, visit from a uh, parent company. So let's say uh, like, Toyota, if you are the manager here, you will have a very frequent contact with the HQ, which is in Japan. And probably if there's any problem, people from HQ will come over. Right? They will fly. But nowadays, uh, because of uh, online conference, the uh, online meetings and everything, it, it's more easier. Lah. But, but still... Uh, Constant contact with parent is needed to make sure that uh, there are no agency problems. All right. So, uh, corporate control of agency problems here. Number two, uh, where the whole management of MNC must be focused on maximizing shareholders' wealth. And the third is an act called Serban's Oxley Act uh, to make sure that the process for managers to report on everything are more transparent. So they cannot make a fake report when they want to uh, show their performance. Like in Malaysia, those managers want to report to a foreign uh, parent. They cannot make fake financial statements. Right? That means Malaysia is not doing well, but they worry they will lose their job. So they make a fake financial statement, uh, which is not good. Lah. All right. So the, the act, how does the Sabans Oxley Act improve reporting? Uh, these are the ways. They establish centralized database of information so that it can be compared with different countries. Uh, ensure all data are reported consistently implement system that automatically checks any problems that arise 
speeding up all the process to access data and um, all executives that are involved uh, uh, with input data, they have to be responsible with what they do. All right, so um, the management structure of an MNC can be uh, several types. Uh. Here, here, they categorize into two types, centralized and decentralized. Okay, so you can see here, but later you will see what's the difference. This is a centralized uh, MNC financial management. Okay, this is centralized. The next slide that I'm going to show you is called decentralized. Okay, we go on. This is decentralized. This is centralized. Okay, so what is the difference? The only difference between centralized and decentralized is that they have two financial manager for decentralized system, one financial manager for a centralized system. So a centralized system means, let's say in Malaysia, the company wants to expand to, to open another factory in uh, Johor, let's say, Johor Bahru. They want to open another factory in Johor Bahru. They have to apply to the parent company in, in uh, let's say, Japan. Okay, say, I want to open a Toyota factory in J JB because of many reasons. Uh, I need to apply to Japan and Japan financial manager will assess the cost and benefit and revert and will come back and decide hey, whether uh, should they do that or not. All right. But a decentralized multinational financial management where probably each country has their own financial manager. So they have budget. Let's say Malaysia wants to open a factory in JB. They don't have to go until Japan because now the management is decentralized. It's not all reliant on Japan. So Japan set up another finance department in Malaysia so that here, the finance department here will handle all the financial needs here. So if you want to open a factory in JB uh, in a decentralized uh, style, in a decentralized uh, format, then you don't have to apply all the way to Japan. You just need to apply to Malaysia's financial manager. So Malaysia financial manager will look into the cost and benefit and they think that, oh, it's okay. So it will be started to open a factory in KB. So this is the difference between centralized and decentralized. All right, there are pros and cons for both methods. Okay, decentralized, of course, is going to be more expensive because instead of one financial manager, you are going to have two financial managers, right? But what are the benefits? Benefits is because the financial manager of a decentralized system, you have one financial manager in Malaysia, they will understand the situation here better and they can make faster decisions. Right, rather than a centralized system, you go all the way to Japan and financial manager may be too burdened, too many things to handle. The decision making may be slower. Right, but in this centralized manner, they can ensure that everything is consistent, everything stays the same, and uh, there is no inconsistency. It, it also saves costs because you only need to have one financial manager, right? Okay, so here now is the most important question. Why do companies or MNCs pursue international business in the first place, right? If they can do well in their own country, why do they need to go international? Okay, so there are three theories right here. One is the theory of competitive advantage. That means specialization increases product efficiency. Example, I will give you iPhone. You know, iPhone, 
iPhone 13 just released iPhone. Okay, iPhone is entirely Apple is an entirely US company. But if you look at an iPhone, you will see that iPhone is designed in US but is made in China. So because of that, you see US and China, you know that Apple is a multinational company, right? Because it involves two countries. Okay, so why do they make in China? It straight away answers the first question, theory of competitive advantage. Why should iPhone be made in China? Because they specialize in China, people specialize in production efficiency. Not to say US cannot produce iPhone, they can. But are they efficient? That's the question. So maybe China can produce more efficiently so they can produce uh, a lot of units at a lower cost and at a faster time. Okay, competitive advantage. The next is imperfect market theory. Factors of production are somewhat immobile, providing incentive to seek out foreign opportunities. Okay, for example, uh, uh, Grab. Grab. Grab exists because of imperfect market, right? Okay, before Grab, before there is Grab, how do you move from A to B? How do you move from point A to point B? You either ask people to fetch, ask your friend to fetch, or worse, worse, take a taxi. But when you take a taxi, you feel scared. Scared for many reasons. One, the, the taxi fella might be dangerous. Uh, second, the taxi person might not use the meter and they cheat you. Alright, so that is an imperfect market. So, Grab exists. Grab is not a taxi. Uh. Grab is just an app. The app is very powerful that it can make sure that you are safe. Okay, safe in terms of safety as well as in the amount that you are going to pay for the service. So, because of this imperfect market theory, especially uh, in Asia and uh, probably around the world, Grab is becoming more and more powerful. Right? Like Thailand, when you go Thailand, when you go uh, uh, Singapore, Indonesia or, or, or Cambodia, anywhere, Vietnam, um, this grab solves a lot of problems. So, because there is a need to solve this imperfect market, grab becomes in demand. So, grab do not just want to focus on Malaysia. They don't just focus on Singapore. They expand to all these places to provide incentive, okay? To provide service and at the same time, they also uh, expand their market. The next, product cycle theory also relates to uh, Grab, but I'll probably uh, give Toyota, for example. Okay, Product cycle theory, as a firm matures, it recognizes opportunities outside its domestic market. This one, I will bring in Toyota. You know, Toyota is a big name in, in Japan, but why don't they just focus on Japan? Why they want to go to around the world why okay see toyota is popular for what toyota is long lasting right fuel efficiency right and also economical it's very cheap a toyota car is cheap and last long right so the problem with cheap and last long if they focus only on japan they will die why because one thing japan Japanese, they keep things very long. So if the Jap the car is long lasting, they won't need to buy new car. So they can only they can only uh sell one car to one person. Oh, hold on, uh. hold on, hold on. Hey. 
Sorry, I'm back. Uh, by the way, any questions so far? You're still with me? Any questions so far? No? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll cover this third one and then we go for a break. All right, so the third one, product cycle theory, as I mentioned, Toyota. Because Toyota was uh, is so reliable, their car, and it, it becomes mature, it, it matures in the country. That means they are, they are big, they are reliable and things. But remaining inside Japan um, limits their opportunities. That, that means they cannot uh, profit much. Their, their profits are limited and when the profits are limited, they cannot uh, have much funds for more R&D, research and development. That means they cannot uh, create more uh, advanced cars, right? They cannot do that. So in order to get more profit, they have to expand. So that is why Toyota expands all over the world. So if you see Malaysia, I know a lot of Vios, uh, Camry, or Toyota cars, they, after 10 years, cars older than 10 years, uh, Toyota still function very well. Okay, for all you know, like this Vios, uh, this latest Vios, every year got new facelift, 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 but you know their engine uh, is not new. It's probably 10 years ago technology. They never change their engine, but they just change the design. Right? This, this is what I understand. So, as firms like Toyota matures, it recognizes opportunities outside its domestic market because the country that they are in, Japan, is already mature, fully mature. They cannot grow anymore. So, they have to grow in other countries. All right, so companies, uh, all these MNCs, they go into international business for a reason. And this reason can be for a competitive or for a comparative advantage. All right, okay, I'm going to leave you uh, with that competitive and comparative advantage to think about and we have a short break probably 15 minutes we have 15 minutes break uh, have a, a rest everything uh, but think about competitive advantage think of an example and uh, come back and uh, maybe we can share about this okay so, so, so we have a short 15 minutes break and I'll see you in at 12.05. Is that okay? All right. See you. See you guys.
All right, guys, welcome back. If you are back, just raise your hand. All right, thanks. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, as um, mentioned just now, competitive and comparative advantage. What do you understand? Maybe you can give an example. Basil, what do you understand with competitive and comparative advantage? Sanjita, maybe you give an example of a competitive and comparative advantage. Okay, what about comparative? Kunjambu, Mala, you want to try? Yuan Hao, you can also add on. All right. Okay, so it's a bit um probably a bit um complicated to explain competitive and comparative, but uh to sum up, a competitive advantage simply means that a company or a country, yeah can produce better goods than the other. All right, so uh, what to say? Uh, let's say, um, okay, let's say Singapore. Okay, Singapore and Grab. Grab can have a competitive advantage over many other uh, apps because they have the ability to do so. They have a lot of uh, IT experts. They have a lot of uh, um, infrastructure available for them to do, right? That, that is competitive advantage. They can do the app better than many others. Okay, uh, a comparative advantage means what? As, as Pace say, produce something at a lower opportunity cost. Okay, so how how do you how do you say that? I will give a, a example. Try to see whether you understand or not. Okay, for example, Malaysia, we produce a lot of what? We produce a lot of um cooking oil. Do you know, Malaysia? We produce a lot of cooking oil, and cooking oil comes from where? Come from oil pump okay palm oil palm oil the palm tree yeah, that comes out with the fruit the fruit is then cooked and then squeeze out all the oil and this oil will be used as your cooking oil so does that mean that malaysia produces better cooking oil than many countries no doesn't mean that it's simply because in the past we have been doing that, okay? In the past, we already grow these palm oil trees 
uh, and then uh, manage this plantation well. And then after two, three years, three, four years, only the tree will produce oil, will produce fruit. So do we produce better trees? Do we produce better trees? Do we produce better oil? No, not necessarily. But, of course, we have an advantage of, over other countries because our trees are already producing oil. So, the opportunity cost uh, of two or three years in order to plant and harvest, we already have. So Malaysia have a comparative advantage in planting oil. Not to say other people cannot be better. Huh? Maybe, maybe let's say Japan, if they want to produce, um, if they want to produce palm oil, they can, they can. But will that be beneficial or not? Maybe they say, hey, yeah, don't need lah. Just let Malaysia produce. So therefore, Malaysia have a comparative advantage because we have lower opportunity cost. We already passed three years, four years, the trees already producing fruit. Okay, that is comparative. Competitive advantage means one company or one country can produce something better than another. That one win win uh win already. Win already. But comparative means we win in terms of opportunity cost. Okay? Do, do you get a clear picture? Do you get a clearer picture? Well, through this. Ala, comparative analysis on trade and competition based on company or firm. Yeah. Alright. So, it is not comp uh, so each have their advantages like competitive or comparative okay okay moving on huh? so uh product life cycle of a uh, international product if we go from one number one here well, company creates a product to accommodate local demand. Right? Let's say Malaysia. We we like to fly, right? We like to fly. Our left, bottom, and right uh, all are sea. And we are only connected to two countries, right? We are only connected to Thailand and Singapore by land. Right? Our neighbor. So how do we fly? How how do we travel to Sabah Sarawak? How do we travel to Indonesia? We have no choice but to fly. So therefore, Air Asia came about. Air Asia creates a product to accommodate local demand. So Malaysia can fly lah. Malaysians can fly. Now everyone can fly. They say Malaysia can fly. Okay. Now the company starts to export. Number two starts to export product to accommodate foreign demand. Then they notice, eh. Hey, not only Malaysia want to fly. Other people in Asia also want to fly. So they create Air Asia. So this Asia airline is to cater for the flight demand in Asian countries. So let's say Japan to fly to Malaysia, Malaysia fly to Japan, Malaysia fly to Korea, uh, Japan fly to Korea, Japan fly to Thailand. Oh, they can engage Air Asia. So firms start to export the product to accommodate foreign demand. Right? You can take this example to Grab also. Lah. Grab also the same. Shopee also the same. Okay, all this. I'm I'm naming all these uh, apps or services that you use recently. Okay, by the way, uh, uh, maybe you can try something new uh, since you are uh, working from home, studying from home all, all this while. Uh, you can try these two new things. Uh. Um, Shopee food. Okay, if you like to buy things from Shopee, now you op update your app, you go into Shopee, you can order food. And uh, I think the service is quite good. It's, 
I, I don't use food panda i don't use grab because a bit complicated i do use shopee so shopee food seems interesting i have not tried but looks easy lah okay shopee food another that you can try you you, you know uh air asia over the one year they cannot fly ma. so they have ventured into this thing called air asia super app means now air asia is no longer an airline company only they also have an app okay if you download the app you can order food okay like um nasi lemak quite cheap and also the delivery is quite efficient you can try the nasi lemak i think only seven six ringgit six or seven ringgit nasi lemak free delivery so you can order what four 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 sets of nasi lemak delivered to your home free delivery quite cheap 20 ringgit you can get uh, i tried before that one i tried once air asia you try try to check air asia you order their nasi lemak uh, the reason why i recommend is because i think it's worth it's worth it like uh, food panda stuff right it's quite expensive but uh, air asia super app quite quite efficient quite cheap also quite fast also they have cloud kitchen quite interesting right so basically these are the things like that has been going on all right so moving on to three firm establishes foreign subsidiary to establish presence in foreign country and possibly reduce costs okay air asia is a malaysian company but they also set up air asia thailand air asia japan why okay uh, so this is reason number three why they set up because they want to have a presence in that country and maybe to reduce cost okay for a and for b the firm then differentiates the product from the competitor and expand product line in foreign country or foreign business declines as competitive advantages are eliminated so what will happen will be either they expand or they lose out to the competitor <laughs> all right so moving on um how companies engage in international business one to six international trade licensing franchising jv joint venture acquisition of existing operation or establishing new foreign subsidiaries okay so um, if you look uh, at the bottom are uh, several companies char time funded by me touch and go spritzer boost okay uh, these are uh, just offhand uh, what i can think of um, these companies uh, do try to engage in foreign or international business okay so so let's first go into international trade so the international business can be done through one of these six ways okay international trade is a conservative approach used by firm to penetrate market and obtain supply at a low cost um, in malaysia uh, we also have international trade okay for example toyota okay maybe don't say toyota uh, let's say a sports car sports car uh ferrari okay ferrari uh then here i mentioned this ckd and cbu what is ckd what is cbu sorry is that yes mala you raise hand anything ah okay wrongly press okay let's continue so um let's go back to toyota if you want to buy a toyota car uh, it can be a ckd or it can be a cbu so what is ckd ckd is completely knocked down what is CBU? CBU is completely built up. 
Okay, so my question is in Toyota, do we have a factory in Malaysia? Answer is, um, I believe answer is yes. Okay, that means if you buy certain cars like Vios, popular ones, uh, Toyota Vios, um, Toyota Camry, these are most likely CKD, completely locked down. That means uh, they manufacture the parts here and they use the parts and assemble into a car. So everything is done in Malaysia, product everything in Malaysia. So you get a CKD car, it is 100% made in Malaysia, although the name is Toyota, lah, but it's made in Malaysia. Okay. But what is a CBU? CBU is completely built up. Means if we want to buy certain cars, like, like um, let's say uh, Tesla. Tesla is an electric vehicle, right? Electric vehicle Tesla is not, we, we don't see that in Malaysia. But is it on the road? I, I saw, I've seen one or two before. Tesla electric car it's not from malaysia it's not made in malaysia malaysia cannot make such a car so how can you import yes you can as long as you have the money and you have the license okay so cars like tesla they are not made here they are imported here maybe by uh, air or by land or, or by ship so they are built they are manufactured and built somewhere else and then they are shipped here they are imported here that is completely built up so through international trade uh, and importing exporting when you import something because the country do not have that it is also a way of international trade you want to buy electric car malaysia don't have you can import you want to buy something malaysia don't have you import Okay, a lot lah, like um, a lot of Apple products, uh, like iPhone, all these, these are all imported, right? So why do they do that? Because there is minim minimal risk. You When there is order, then only you import. Okay. So uh, recently, internet has allowed international trade to... Um, to become more and more viral, more, more, more easier to do. Let's say everything, you know this uh, website called Taobao, right? You go online, you can buy almost anything, even shirt, even your underwear, eh, you can buy from Taobao. A lot of my friends uh, who, who got, got married, eh, they, they buy their wedding dress from Taobao. Right? So it is basically... Uh, importing so it to us we import to you to to china the manufacturing firm they export so they then have to set up a company here they can maintain remain in their own country and do business around the world all right another way of uh, international business is through licensing so it provides a company overseas provide technology to uh, a local company uh, in exchange for fees or some other benefits. And then they allow the company to use their technology in a foreign market without major investment, without transportation, uh, result from exporting. Um, one example is like, uh, is like uh, Family Mart. No Family Mart. Yeah, Family Mart is not Malaysian, right? Family Mart, I don't know whether it's Taiwanese or Japanese. I think it's Japanese. Okay, Family Mart uh, came to Malaysia. But how did they come? They actually did not open it themselves. They gave the license to one company. So in Malaysia, only one company has the license to open and manage Family Mart. Okay, if you check, the company is called QL Resources. QL Resources. Okay, they have the license. Trademark, lah, basically, uh, the, the family mark provide the trademarks to this company so that for a fee, 
so that they can use their technology in Malaysia. Franchising. Franchising is another way uh, to penetrate foreign markets like, like McDonald's, 7-Eleven, Char Time. Right. So um, if you want to open uh, 7-Eleven, can you? You can. 7-Eleven is not Malaysian. Uh, Char Time is Malaysian, yes. Uh, Char Time is not Malaysian. Char Time is Taiwan. So if you want to open uh, Char Time anywhere, you can, but you need to sign a franchise contract. Right? Char Time, you need to sign with the Taiwanese company to open a Char Time here. Okay. JV, joint venture. A venture that is jointly owned and operated by two or more companies. A firm may enter into a foreign market by engaging in a joint venture. Very uh, good example for this will be Proton. If you know that a few years ago, Proton sold 49% of its ownership to a Chinese company in China. Okay, one of the largest uh, car manufacturer in China. Uh, so now Proton is a JV company, joint venture. So because of this joint venture, they transfer some of the technology to produce the car called X70 and X50, if you know. Okay. And um, this is not just limited to that. Um, through the JV, uh, uh, this China company also managed to get uh, about 51% of uh, another company owned by Proton, which is Lotus. Lotus produces sports car in UK. So originally owned by Proton, now it is belongs to China. So this company go into JV because they want to enter into foreign market. They want to enter Malaysia. They want to enter into UK. So that is why they go into a JV to enter into certain markets. Okay, another way to enter into a foreign market is by acquisition of existing operation. Okay, let's say um, you, your company is in Malaysia. You want to enter into Singapore. But to set up everything from zero uh, will be very costly. So what you can do, you can find another company that is probably doing the same thing as you, but smaller. So what you can do is you can acquire the company. All right. Acquire the company, buy the company, and use the existing resources. Use the same manager, use the uh, office space, everything. You use it uh, because you already paid to buy the existing operation. All right. This is also one way to enter into foreign market. The next and most costly way to enter into a foreign market is by establishing new foreign subsidiary. You want to go into certain market. You uh, one example uh, acquisition of existing operation. One example I forgot to mention. You know Lotus. Lotus Malaysia, you know Tesco, yeah, if you go Tesco uh, in Malaysia, no longer Tesco, they are now belong to Lotus. Lotus is a Thailand group, very big supermarket in Thailand. They enter Malaysia market through acquisition, they buy over Tesco, right, instead of Coming in as new means new. They have to buy land and then they have to build their own supermarket. No, they take over Tesco, so they convert all Tesco building into Lotus. Okay, this is the difference between establishing new foreign subsidiaries 
and acquisition. Okay, so um, in, in summary, any method uh, of increasing international business requires direct foreign investment called the DFI. Okay, but uh, international trade and licensing usually is not DFI because uh, foreign company don't pump money into the country. Okay. Only when the foreign company put a lot of money into this foreign company, this business, then it will be considered a DFI. All right, so um, based on the different methods uh, of international uh, business, the first one, international trade is easy. Just import, export. You want something from US, Malaysia don't have, you import. Okay, like Malaysia don't have oyster. Ma. So what do we import? We import oyster from Australia. Okay, and, um, and, and many other things. Ah. Okay, but that one doesn't involve any investment. But the next one, licensing, franchising, and joint venture. If you want to operate, uh, you want to operate char time. Yeah, char time. Huh? It, it, it is a overseas brand. So in order to operate, you have to buy the license. So you, your cash outflow to buy the license and then um, whatever that uh, Family Mart sold, they don't sell anything. They only sell their license. So they get an inflow. Okay, this is the MNC's outflow and inflow. All right. Okay, so the next is um, investment in foreign subsidiary. That means buying. So when uh, M, like Lotus, uh, they buy Tesco cash outflow. And whatever the Lotus sell in Malaysia, they earn they cash inflow back to the company in Thailand. Okay, so this is how the flows of money. All right. So the valuation model is very straightforward. Cash flow divided by 1 plus K. Okay, K is the cost of capital or required rate of return. This is standard uh, discounted cash flow model. Okay, not, nothing difficult. But a multinational uh, cash flow model, a bit difficult because you need to find the ECF. You need to find the cash flow. In order to find the cash flow, you need to find out what country they have operate in and you need to times with their exchange rate. So let's say this is McDonald. Okay, this is McDonald. This is the cash flow they need to calculate their value. But you know McDonald's, they operate in Thailand and many other countries like Malaysia and Singapore. Okay, and all these are income in different currency. So all the cash flow is different and all the exchange rate is different. This EST is exchange rate. Okay, all their exchange rate is different and all their cash flow denominated in the uh, domestic currency is different. So in Thailand, their profits will be in Thai baht. In, ring, in Malaysia, the profits will be in ringgit. In Singapore, profits will be in Singapore dollars. But all they need, they need to value McDonald's in US, US dollar, because it is a US company. So how? In order to find the cash flow, they have to sum up Thailand earnings in Thai, earnings in Malaysia, earnings in Singapore. You need to times the respective foreign exchange rate to convert it into US dollar to find the cash flow. Okay, this is one step extra for an MNC. Okay, 
nothing much just need to take into the foreign exchange conversion into consideration because you don't just operate in one country when you operate in many countries one factor is the exchange rate okay moving forward uh yeah this is the thing okay so because of this one factor because of this one thing uh foreign exchange um and also operating in many countries there are a lot of uncertainty compared to a single country company let's say your company only operate in malaysia then not a big problem okay what i earn ringgit what i pay salary ringgit that's it but if you are a multinational company you have a lot of different uncertainty the main one i would say will be the exchange rate risk okay because whatever you earn in other country you need to convert back so if the conversion is not good then you will probably make a loss but apart from that there will also be international political risk and international economic condition for example international political risk like um afghanistan you see afghanistan what happened it was taken over by uh, some what they call as a terrorist group taliban so because of this political instability so businesses will be affected originally a lot of planes uh, a lot of travelers and working people they travel to afghanistan to work all right to to perform business activities but because of that because of political instability people cannot fly there people cannot fly there you can see that the hotels will be affected travel industry affected airline affected right secondly international economic condition so certain countries uh, uh the economy may be bad like um let's say like uh like covid covid 19 some country handle it well right like uh china they handle it quite well uh even if you look at europe uh, now everything is almost back to normal where people can go out some even don't wear masks they go out no problem in malaysia no our recovery is a bit slower all right so economic condition will also affect um mnc so let's say toyota is an mnc ma. so the if the sales all over the world is okay but because of pandemic hit they 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 are hit badly because every country is the same but economic recovery toyota will be strong again but not all the same some country already no longer mco people can go out people can start buying car but in malaysia we still cannot cross border if you cannot cross border and we all still work from home many people find that i hey, don't need to buy a car ma. right so the business in different countries will be affected differently all right so this is the kind of risk that mnc will face where a normal company which is not mnc will not face okay so mnc will be faced with a lot more risk all right so if there's higher uncertainty the valuation will drop all right so this is how it will be affected if you look at the economy and political risk what does it affect it affects the foreign cash flow so the value of the parent company will drop but there is one more is the exchange rate risk exchange rate risk will not affect cash flow it will affect the exchange rate and exchange rate affected value will also drop so these are how these three factors will affect value of an MN MNC.
all right? But not to say COVID will affect all MNC badly. If you look at uh, like company like Zoom, like Facebook, they are not affected. Like Microsoft, Google, they are not affected because of the nature of business. When people work from home, they actually need more of these softwares. So foreign economy, political, it's not affected. Exchange rate risk, also not affected. But if you look at different industry like car, automobile, uh, airline, uh, they are affected because COVID affects economy and um, airline will also be affected by political risk and so on. All right. Okay, so um, the following chapters we will talk about uh, background of international financial market from chapter 2 to 5 and then um, the rest. Lah. But the main thing is to focus on valuation of MNC, multinational companies. All right. So the summary of a uh, whole chapter is uh, here at the end of the slides. Right, guys, do you have any questions so far? Do you have any questions so far? So far, no question. Yen Hao, okay. All right. So, all right. That's good. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to uh, ask in the chat box or turn on your mic or uh, even after the class has ended, you can always WhatsApp me. If there's no question, then I think we can end our class, our first lecture for today. And you can all have your lunch. Ah, by the way, uh, those who have attended lectures with me, uh, do you think um, you prefer uh, Google Meet? This way is okay, or do you do 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 you want the app I used before the gather app? Many ways we can go online nowadays. Google Meets okay, or gather app, so you can walk around. Oh, anything okay. Mala prefer Google Meet. Both also okay. Or can. Yet how you, you have not used uh, Gather. Have you used Gather before? You can walk around. I, I like Gather. can walk around. My only problem is sometimes lag. That's my only problem. Other than that, I think gather is quite nice. Can walk around. <laughs> Look, no one lag. But yeah, how have you tried gather before? No. Okay, we can try gather in our next class next week. We can try once for our friend. I think the rest, the rest of you. <laughs> In the past semester, you tried gather before, uh, quite fun. Uh. Can walk around, but I think gather will be good if there is tutorial. Then we can split into groups, uh, and then you can uh, talk, you can discuss. That that that's the reason why I think uh, gather has the advantage. Yuan Hao, do you attend lectures on your laptop and computer, or you use tablet? Phone, 
You don't use laptop ah? or, or computer? Ah? Alamak. Then cannot use gather. Lo. If one gather, have to use a computer. <laughs> Okay, um, anyway, um, learning can can be in any form, whether you have computer or phone or tablet, it doesn't matter. As long as uh, what I covered today and in the future you, you are able to understand and uh, answer your final exam, then it shouldn't be a problem. All right, so if there's no question, I'll see you next week. Okay, take care. See you. Uh, sir, I got a few things to ask you. Okay, sure. Uh, so, uh, when Mr. Frankie told me that I have an additional subject, so so he said he will update me. Uh, what subject is that, sir? What subject are you taking? Uh? I'm yes. taking five subjects. Uh, as I send you the subject, management.